Let's continue with the global state of fashion. COVID-19 has severely disrupted the fashion industry. There's no doubt about that. And it's important to take the time to assess the state of global fashion industry and discuss current opportunities and challenges with respect to sustainability. Our following guests are Esther Pan Sloan, Head of Partnerships, Policy and Communications at the UN Capital Development Fund. Um, but also I'm really glad to have Lucila Boysen, right? Director of South Africa, of the South Africa Fashion Week. Hi there. Yes. And, Hello, hi. And, and I hope that I rehearsed it properly with all the names, and you heard it before, but it's Yame Reich or Reich. Hayes. Reis, creative Hello. director from yeah. Rio Hello, Ethical Fashion. And of course, and last but not least, this is much easier for uh, a German easy. guy, Kim <laughs> Scholze, chief sustainable community manager and head of storytelling at Sympathex, uh, which is joining us here live at the studio. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. And let me, let, let me start with an open question to all of you. So whoever, whoever uh, feels to answer first, please go ahead, uh, because I would like to know in what ways has the pandemic impacted the fashion industry's journey to long-term sustainability? Have you noticed any new challenges or opportunities? Well, Shall I would I like start? to say, yeah, ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> A lot of ladies. So I'm Liz. I'm Lucilla Boysen from the South African Fashion Week. And I want to say that um, in 2019, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition has put a master plan together where they have committed to growing the local market, um, doing local sourcing, putting incentive programs in place, and work on the production flexibility to align the sales cycles and focus on the value chain transformation, which, of course, is exact has a complete impact on um, sustainability. I um, focus on the creative fashion design industry. Um, as you might have heard, um, I am the founder of the South African Fashion Week. And um, I would like to start with the challenges because it's always good to start with the, with the bad news and then go to the, to the good news. Um, in, um, in South Africa, the industries do not work with the designers. So we have not, like, for instance, in Italy, been able to bring the industries together with the designers. Um, we are not a designer-led industry. And, and I think that um, that is um, in, in all of Africa. Uh, it, it is manufacturing-led, and, and, of course, that poses a problem because the designers are very pro-change and very pro-sustainability. Um, and if they don't lead it... Um, um, there's, there becomes there's like a, a gap. Um, there's there's not um, a great. Um, we don't have a culture of research, so um, there's not global on on a, on a global level. There's not understanding um, of what happens on a on a global level. And of course, we don't have um, fabrication because or fabrics, the right fabrics, because uh, because the industries are not talking to each other. Um, we cannot, there's, there's a weakness when it comes to the development of fabrics. We have incredible raw products. So it's wool, mohair, cotton, and leather, but everything gets exported. And um, so uh, for me, one of the, the weaknesses is that, that our government uh, um, does not see the opportunities that lies within um, developing the local industries, or maybe they see it, but, but it's, it's, it's not the right time for them to focus on that. Um, from the South African Fashion Week side, we have got about 500 SMMEs, um, which is great, which is absolutely fantastic, and most of them have their own studios, which means that they can they don't use a huge amount of electricity they work ethically they they pay their workers the right fee they they are they are working with as far as they can sustainable fabrics and then it's easy in south africa to start a business so it's easy to create those leaders that can in future influence um, the sustainability policies um, and their their followers are loyal so if a designer um, Says, uh, uh, says, I'm going a, a sustainable route, and they stick to it and they communicate it. Like the previous speaker has said, it's very important that, that communication. Then the followers will follow, and they do follow. Um, and, and it's easy for our designers to 
to sort of set a pace or set a standard because we don't have a fashion history in South Africa. And, and you know, when you don't have a history, it's much easier to, to, to create your own history or to create your own sort of standards and, and, and what you stand for. And then, of course, social media is opened usually in South Africa. I mean, I think it's all over the world. The designers are communicating 100% more than what they've communicated in the past. And at the South African Fashion Week, all our competitions, so we bring our designers into the retail space through our competitions, and all our competitions are fully sustainable. Um, so um, we are trying our best to connect the industries with the designers so that in moving forward, they can absolutely focus on sustainability. Thank you. Uh, Lucilla, thank you for, uh, for, for your insight on that matter because I, I just would, would like to go straight to Kim because that was kind of new to me knowing that there are nations which is not where the development of fabrics is not pushed by designers. Is it really so much different, for instance, like here in Europe or in Germany? Because I always feel like the industry has its, their own idea. They're presented to the designers and the designer do something out of it. Is it, is it the opposite to Africa over here? I'm, I'm not sure because it depends on the various levels where you see it from the fashion perspective. What I can contribute in this case is that I see it from the like sporting good apparel industry perspective. Mm. And there is definitely, um, it's different to what um, you were just saying because there's a strong collaboration between all the CSR people and the legislations which change at the moment for the example for the Green Deal approaches. So this is, there's a huge collaborational effect and of course the trade shows definitely do not their job at the moment because they do not take place, but normally that's the hub where things go on, where, where it's getting started. Okay. Uh, anyone else who wants to add up to this? That was just like a question that I had to ask myself. Of course, Sloan. Um, well, oh, yeah. so I don't have anything on the fabrics, but to say the impact of the pandemic, um, UNCDF works in the poorest countries in the world, known as the least developed countries, the 46 poorest countries. And the pandemic has, of course, had a terrible impact on the poorest countries. So the LDCs as a whole are expecting something like 40% less foreign direct investment as a result of the pandemic. And of course, that will hit garment workers and other uh, low paid and more informal workers very hard. One thing that our agency works on is digital payments for garment workers in Bangladesh and other locations. So while we see the damaging effects of the pandemic, we also see that there are quite a lot of opportunities for manufacturers to switch to uh, tools like digital payments to make sure that their workers are receiving their payments, they're safer, there's less risk of loss, and that also the workers have more options once they receive their payments in digital form, they're more likely to save uh, some of it instead of taking it home and, and handing it over to a family member or using it entirely as consumption. So we have seen the effects of the pandemic, but also new opportunities for the fashion industry that have come out of it. Thank you. Uh, Esther, as, as you just, just replied to that question, I, I would just would add up another one to it because 2021 marks the second year of the decade of action to deliver the SDGs by 2030. So I would like to know from you, of course, because you should know about it, are certain SDGs more on track than others? And where is more focus needed within the fashion industry? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, the UN does a great job reporting on the SDGs. And every year there's a session actually coming up in July called the High Level Political Forum, where countries will report on specific SDGs that are selected every year. Um, so your audience, if they're interested, can check on the reports from specific countries and specific SDGs. I would say we hear a lot of attention on climate, gender, and maybe oceans. So there are definitely certain SDGs that are more popular with people, they get more attention. Uh, poverty gets some recognition, but of course the pandemic has really set back poverty eradication efforts. So I would say on the in the fashion industry, you know, we would really welcome more attention on circular economy issues, resource use, water use, reducing the use of dyes, you know, encouraging consumers to, um, to do SDG 12, essentially sustainable consumption and production. That's the whole idea behind the circular economy to try to reduce the amount of natural resources we use as uh, a planet, as the globe. So we would really welcome more attention in those areas. 
Thank you, Esther. Really love the, the, the switch in between continents, so that's why I'm just going back to, to Rio over there, because Ayame, as the creative director of the Rio Ethical Fashion, you interact with stakeholders across the industry. Um, what challenges do you think are still holding back stakeholders from prioritizing sustainability? Um, well, I think that uh, I'm talking from Brazil. We have a very big industry, a very big fashion industry here. I think that, uh, in fact, we have uh, many challenges to sustainability throughout the supply chain. And one of the product from the beginning to the end of production process, knowing the source, who made it, the conditions in which they are made, etc., to work in a sustainable way involves slower processes of verifying the practices, negotiating with the suppliers, look for new materials. And we know that many times the production speed tramples on the processes necessary to sustainability. Uh, the lack of public policies promote the, uh, to promote the green economy in Brazil is a factor that delays the decision to invest in new technological solutions and new business models of for circular economy. The companies need to remodel and adapt their businesses, and they do not always have the resources to implement these innovations. From a point of view of the SDGs, uh, we can talk about three big challenges for our industry. The SDG 13, Fight Climate Change, puts the need to companies to measure their carbon uh, gas emissions and seek to reduce them. To Unfortunately, you're breaking Hello? up a bit. Yeah, we, we, the, the last, we haven't heard the last sentence. Do you mind repeating it for us? Oh, okay. Uh, about the SDG 13, Fight Climate Change puts the need to companies to measure their carbon footprints and seek to reduce them to zero by 2050. It's urgent to look for new regenerative materials and to use renewable energy sources all along the production chain. Uh, and only a few companies today fulfill this task completely. And being a very fragmented industry, it's necessary a huge collaboration between all the stakeholders in order to reach this goal in all steps of production. Uh, about the SDG 15 refers to the restoration of the bi biodiversity and the production of species, protection of species and natural ecosystems. It's very related to textile materials and soil usage in agriculture. And here I'm talking about cotton, which Brazil is the second largest global exporter that's cultivated in an extractive monocrop system with an intense use of pesticides, causing deforestation, extreme damage to river sources, to the soil, and also to the communities and workers dealing with the pesticides. So it's urgent to focus on this goal to replace this extractive way of producing by agroecology and agroforest systems that besides being regenerative, bring direct social benefits regarding food security, fulfilling also SDG 1 and 2 by eradicating poverty and hunger. And finally, the SDG 14 refers to the protection of oceans, in which the fashion industry can collaborate removing all single-use plastics from packaging, and also reducing the use of polyester that releases microplastic into the ocean, causing a huge loss of marine life. And we know that this is already a huge challenge since polyester is the most used fiber, fiber in the global uh, textile industry. So I think that the challenges are many, that maybe it's not possible to approach all of them at the same time. But it's important to begin and to understand that it's a collective effort of the whole sector. Thank you. Thank you, Yame. Um, as we're talking about the environment, of course, you think of nature and all that. That brings me to you, Kim, uh, talking about outdoor fashion. It's, it's kind of weird, fashion outdoor, where nobody really sees you. But I understand that there's still a fight uh, that the industry, at least, is it's, it's fighting its image of not being very sustainable. Although many customers are considered nature lovers, I feel if there would be nature lovers, there wouldn't be as uh, there wouldn't be so into the need of being so protected by nature. This is what also like the outdoor fashion is supplying. But the real question is, where does the industry stand right now in terms of sustainability? 
So, and I haven't answered the first question, to be honest, how sustainability was accelerated by the COVID period, and this more or less leads to... Kim, feel free. This I do, I do, among I friends do merge, here. I yes, do merge the two questions, because if you see the um, development of the last five to eight years when it comes to outdoor sector, and outdoor mainly considered as a footwear and apparel, it, it heavily improved that um, there need to be transparency towards the consumer, there need to be different supply chain management methods, as we already heard right now. And what happened was via COVID that it was accelerated even more. So the need from do we protect our playground or what do we do with nature if, mm. if we want to go out and if we really love what we do, then it's a contradictive thing, as you were saying. And to bring it um, maybe to a different level, if you, what you were saying was do we need water resistance? Do we need breathability? How much chemical hazards? I do need it, but this is the question. Does it, it is make the me question. nature lovers exactly. that try to avoid it? It's, it's, and it's, it's the kind of where do you start that conversation and where do you avoid it? Because there's already this thinking that you need to be protected. But the question of being protected, if you, if you turn it around using PTFE, using all the different um, chemical hazard right. for nature is really a, a huge thing for the industry right now. And bringing that back to the point of transparency, the outdoor industry is doing so much, which has various roadmaps. Some years ago, some were really strong already at the beginning, but being in the center of that outdoor thinking, having various studies from NGOs, etc., it, it felt for a time in between that they were not really able to communicate. And now that changed enormously. And now it's really transparent. As I said, lots of the brands are working together. It should be more, the collaborative in impact on that to really make sure that consumers know what they need if they need to be protected mm -hmm. or what they can. And this is, uh, yeah, it's a huge topic. And I think it should be, should be even more on the agenda of everybody. Absolutely, because sometimes I feel like, especially like city kids, they don't even know what it means to be like in the uh, in, in the wild out there. So, oh, they have mosquitoes. Oh, they have flies. Oh my God, I'm dying. <laughs> so that's a, a different kind of story, and it kind of really feel, sees that we are kind of disconnected about what life is really about. And maybe sorry for adding that, because we were in the supply chain there already. So many bio-based solutions, and what um, all the my colleagues on stage <laughs> were referencing to, from fiber to fiber solutions, and all the NGOs and all the collaborative aspects on innovative solutions are really strong, and this this is a good thing to share. I see. Um, Esther, as the public sector has a significant responsibility to support the advancement of the SDGs across the fashion industry, uh, can you speak to what the UN has been doing uh, to support this? Absolutely. Well, uh, there are great campaigns like the Conscious Fashion Campaign led by our friend Carrie Bannigan. And I know the UN has worked closely to build links with the fashion industry to increase the awareness of the SDGs overall and to encourage the industry to take measures. The UN will not implement anything they'll suggest. Uh, of course, regulations are at the national level. But I think the industry can really do a lot to um, show its leadership in this area. We know that consumers in fashion and investors and young people really care about sustainability. They care about climate issues. It's one of their top priorities. So uh, we see that this is one of the issues that will really drive consumer behavior and also brand loyalty. So we are excited by the pioneers that we see in the fashion industry really taking steps to address both the kind of imperative to meet the SDGs but also the consumer demand for uh, the fashion industries itself and manufacturers to become more sustainable. And uh, coming to Lucila, Lucila, I, I think that you were not even aware that most of the question that I was about to ask you, you pretty much like answered uh, them already like in the, in the first <laughs> question that came up. Uh, but again, like what we just heard before, could you maybe again tell us a bit more about the African perspective on the global fashion industry and what is specific about the industry, for example, in South Africa and other leading African uh, fashion na nations? So it's it's very difficult for me to speak from an African point of view because obviously I'm in South Africa and although I have connections with Africa, I don't feel that I am in a position to speak on their behalf. But in South Africa, the South African designers are embracing global fashion. But what they are doing and what is really interesting is that they use their design soul and they, they put an African, because obviously you cannot design like a European designer. They, um, they take their 
their design style and they put that forward. You can see that coming through in their designs. And that to me is very interesting and something that I've been waiting for almost 20 years to happen. It, it's refreshing. It's a, it's a new take on fashion. Of course, the African continent is more colorful and more bright and, and you know, happy and wonderful, uh, incredibly um, inspirational. So, um, yes, that is, uh, that is really my, my sort of contribution to, to that. All right. Thank you, Lucia. Yame, um, what next steps would you like to see the fashion community take to align itself more strongly with the SDGs? Uh, specifically, what would you like to see come out of 2021? Um, well, I think that first of all um, is partnerships for the goals, uh, the SDG 17, collaboration between industry and retail is crucial to direct strategies for a circular economy, to reduce the use of natural resources, to support innovation, transparency and traceability, besides finding solutions to the end of life cycle products. I believe we need to talk about degrowth as a necessary step to sustainability. And why do I say that? Degrowth is a critical aspect of sustainability to address both the environmental and ethical transgressions rooted within the production process of fashion industry. It represents a real shift to a conscious supply chain and consumer demand. And from my point of view, it's related to SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. The critical argument about reduced production means reduced employment for garment workers. The concern about job losses could be just the opposite. It could return brands to sign long-term contracts with manufacturers based on lower volumes at slower time frames. The risk of losing jobs is directly related to companies that move from one production zone to the other to obtain the lowest labor costs, treating labor as if it were a commodity. Degrowth offers the potential for increased job security for garment workers, along with the possibility of higher quality jobs. And for consumers, degrowth is about extending clothing life cycles. Decreasing clothing waste and slowing down consumption, buying in secondhand stores, mating and repairing clothes, all this serves to stimulate the shift towards the green economy, one that prioritizes the resources of production rather than exploits them. Campaigns as slow fashion movement, fashion detox that challenges consumers not to consume for three months are good examples of how to educate and change the consumption pace. This is something that Z generation is challenging us to do, the, to change the system for a sustainable and responsible fashion. And to introduce uh, Brazil in this conversation, I would like to mention the No Poison fashion campaign that Rio Ethical Fashion started in collaboration with Fashion Revolution with more than 40,000 signatures uh, since April that fights against the abuse and the use of pesticides in Brazilian cotton, internationally known as Sustainable Better Cotton Initiative. Brazil is the number one on pesticides consumption in the world, and most of those poisons come from European Union, where they are forbidden. Brazilian cotton is cultivated in consortium with soybean in huge properties and enormous areas of land, uh, like the size of France's territory. And many of those producers are involved with deforestation. So it is very concerning to hear that Brazil is the largest producer of sustainable cotton on the planet and the endorsement of many brands and organizations in the fashion industry. In Brazil, there are many academic researchers that consider pesticide usage as a human rights problem because it attacks directly the workers' health, especially women and children in the countryside. Therefore, I mean, uh, there's a lot of greenwashing, and we should be aware that if we do not clarify all those aspects, we will not succeed on the sustainability journey that the SDGs provide us to advance. 
This is the decay that, uh, that will define if humanity succeeds on regenerate nature. And it's up to each of us to collaborate to change. Thank you. Obrigado, Yame. Um, as I see, we do have two questions that came in, which I um, dedicated to all the three panelists, whoever might uh, answer. Although when, when we talk about materials, I don't know, Kim, if this is maybe a, uh, your shtick. So we have uh, talking about materials, the risk of pollution. Is it worse to assess a natural, like cotton, hemp, etc., versus synthetic materials, polyester, etc.? Because I think it it's it's it has his, his advantages, but also like disadvantages. Because uh, cotton and hemp, also the way that you cultivate them, can be as uh, also as, as harmful as, as synthetics. As, yeah, as polyester exactly. And if it 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 mainly relates to the question you were asking. Anyhow, where 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 do I see 21, and where is it? Because closing the loop and using therefore materials which are already there mm. is exactly what polyester might deliver as a solution and not as a problem. And if we bring this in, I think the the um, whole chain, what all my colleagues were talking about is like closing the loop within um, all these aspects, not using new materials, but what is already there. So mm. what, what this leads to is how can we use polyester as a base for the products from a recycled base being then recyclable as well. Right. So this is exactly, I guess, one part of the solution. And I would definitely vote for um, cross-industry collaborations where all the assumption from waste can be used as it is with bottles at the moment. But of course, this is not endless as a source for all the polyester story which is going on. So, Anyone wants to add to that? No? No? Okay, I, I take it as a no. This is why I'm going to ask the second question that came in. How does the global industry perceive consumer trends, like, for example, the vegan lifestyle? Can you say anything about the risk and chances? Okay. Kim, again to you. <laughs> because of industry perceives consumer trends. I, I think um, it's uh, hard, hard to say that in two words, because one thing is um, an approach where, where we have like a dedication to change. We just had the conversation before I came in here. Right. How, 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 how do you feel telling, if you live like this, how you feel being like a teacher? trying to get everybody on board, etc. And on the other hand, of course, that makes, um, in perspective of the outdoor industry, for example, a huge... Um, we need some channels to, to really make it understandable where all, the, where all the problems are and where it could be, could be with solutions. And I think um, it's, it's both because the risks do not... If, if you do not have the right information for that, you, you, cannot, you cannot really live it. So this is um, more the perspective of, of the groundwork. And if, if I think the various countries where you already brought so much in that it's difficult to answer your questions because all is already said, um, I think the perspective on, on countries is different because here in Europe we feel like privileged. We can get everything mm -hmm. and try to get the information going. But if I don't know how it is in... in other markets. So, so my final question, just to 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 to, to end this this panel at this point, um, because I already said I re I'm really in love with this idea that we are connecting via all these uh, uh, different continents with each other, because we see ob obviously that we have a common thread that we need to uh, to to handle. So. From, uh, from your perspective, what is it that you are looking for, what you would wish for, that those kind of exchanges happen more often? Do you have any specific idea, any a specific frequency that you see which is going to be important in order just to push everything forward, just to put every, everyone on the global map so that people have an understanding of each other and maybe even being better in exchanging ideas and technologies? Is there a wish list that you have? I can start. Please, Lucilla. <laughs> yes, so um, from my side, what I would, would like, of course, there are different levels of sustainability. And when I speak, um, I certainly don't speak from a global point of view. When I speak from the South African designers and the African designers, I think it's very important for them to have points or ticking points that they can say, OK, I am 60% sustainable, I am 80% sustainable. We don't have that measure in South Africa and, and in Africa for that matter. And we, can, we, can, we, are, we are really completely behind, which puts us in front of everybody else because we are quite sustainable. And, and if we can get um, 
pointers that can say, okay, or a measuring tool or something that can say, okay, the designers, you are 500 or 600 designers in South Africa, you are, you can measure yourself. And, and these are the points, the measuring points, and, and this is what you've got to work to towards but but we don't have that so we are desperately in need and if anybody out there can can give us or guide us on this i would be very very happy thank you anyone else of course i would love to but i only have two sentences because i see uh, the others want to contribute to. it is um for for the industry i'm speaking for like apparel footwear and workwear it's it's such a huge amount of worth you deliver by sharing knowledge and also solutions right. so this is a community i see where where we all contribute to each other and in europe it starts already it's already in place and this is it so europe is not the entire world so maybe we're talking about the exactly UN. Esther, anything that you can add to it just to add to that to say we should share best practices more because we know yeah. there are terrific lessons to be learned from brazil from south africa from asia and so as manufacturers and as different uh, groups around the world find a solution to a problem, we should just share them and disseminate them to the extent that others can adapt as quickly as possible. Yame? Yeah, yeah, and for me, I think that uh, the most important in Brazil is to develop innovation on materials that are connected with food safety, uh, with agroecology, agroforest, uh, because of the fo we have lots of problems with, with indigenous population and deforestation. So I think we could also, a fashion industry can contribute with uh, poverty eradication in our country and also in Latin America. That's what I want to say. All Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, let's hope that this is not this is just the beginning of a far better exchange. So thank you so much for uh, supporting the cause. Uh, thank thank you so much for having found some time just to uh, join us here. And and now equipped with a strong understanding of the current global state of fashion, our next panel, making peace with nature in the new fashion era, brings together industry experts to highlight the business case for sustainability. But first and foremost, I would like to say thank you, uh, Esther, thank you, Yame, thank you, Lucila, thank you, Kim, for thank having you, been you. here. Thank you, Thanks to all.